don't touch anything until you've disinfected it, right? In the grocery store, wherever you go? Well, maybe not. Our next speaker joins us to share some surprising research that will explain why we might not want to obliterate every germ. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stacey Vasquez. The Greek playwright Euripides once stated, there is no mortal whom sorrow and disease do not touch. Disease is often a recurring theme in many aspects of our society, as it makes for a more interesting story. Because let's face it, as terrifying as the thought of getting sick may be, we find ourselves oddly intrigued by it. Why? Well, every person in this room is susceptible to infection. And of course, there's always the question of, what if I were to get sick? Despite the fact that microorganisms play a crucial role in maintaining the integrity of life, we often become aware of their influence under very negative circumstances. By getting sick, we have to miss out on work, spend time in a waiting room, remember to take medications, pay expensive medical bills, and of course, you could even die if left untreated. So it's no wonder why we've grown so intolerant of microorganisms. Before the dawn of the age of science, catastrophic outbreaks, as depicted in the image behind me, were thought to be the works of angry gods, witches, or demons with malicious intent. It wasn't long before scientists came forward and disproved many of these misguided theories, although the very same people who attributed these outbreaks to invisible supernatural forces thought the idea of disease being caused by microorganisms too small to be seen was absurd. So naturally, they resisted this newfound information. Regardless of their denial of the evidence presented against their traditionally held beliefs, the germ theory was able to stand the test of time. And over the years, scientists discovered many microbiological techniques that allowed us to study these microbes in greater detail. Through this, we figured out how to use them to our benefit and also how to keep them at bay. And this is where we dive into the use of vaccines, antibiotics, and antimicrobial pesticides. They're mass-produced and widely distributed throughout the world, with some countries having stricter regulations than others. And with these powerful tools comes a certain level of responsibility, not just for the producers, but for the consumers as well. And it's one that many of us often fail to uphold. Human behavior has led to many unintended consequences as a result of our careless use of these products. And much of it is due to the amount of misinformation you have floating around. See, some of us have the tendency to believe everything we read without validating whether or not it's true. And rather than using logic and reason with skepticism, you now have it being used to assault the world of science and the researchers and healthcare professionals that function within it. Many of these concepts can be very scary and difficult to digest. So the apprehension makes sense, considering it's difficult to trust something when you may not understand it to begin with. But just because you don't understand something doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true. There are actually parents who refuse vaccinations for their families based on data from really poorly carried out science. And then we wonder why subsequent outbreaks occur. What's very scary is when our citizens begin taking advice from Hollywood actors rather than trusting our scientists and healthcare professionals, when a number of papers have clearly demonstrated the safety and efficacy of vaccinations, yet people still assume there's this big government conspiracy out to get them. And as a result of this, diseases that were once thought to be a thing of the past are now re-emerging and, of course, in search of suitable hosts. Antibiotics will tell a different story. People generally don't refuse antibiotics. In fact, they're overused and not very well understood. And unlike vaccines, people don't really claim to understand how they work. You'd figured we'd learn about this in an introductory biology class or perhaps with a lengthy conversation with our doctor, but the public still remains largely unaware of the difference. If a patient were to be diagnosed with a bacterial infection, the doctor would prescribe them an antibiotic. Though some doctors have been known to prescribe antibiotics without actually validating the presence of an infection, and sometimes they can also give in to the demands of very aggressive parents. Upon receiving these antibiotics, most patients won't take them correctly. They may stop taking them once they feel better, recycle them for the next time they feel crummy, or even pass them off to their friends. A big issue here in the state of Texas is bringing antibiotics over from Mexico. Regulations aren't very tight there. You don't need a prescription, so you can stock up. And they're also not manufactured under the same regulations as the USDA. I understand that undocumented immigrants and narcotics are of great concern for those aiming to protect the border. 
but not so much to where it would overshadow the importance of not allowing these types of antibiotics into our country. So when you take these antibiotics, the other deal that you have is people carelessly take them when they actually aren't suffering from an infection. And this could be very damaging to your immune system. When you actually take antibiotics, you're not just destroying the good bacteria that or the bad bacteria that have managed to infiltrate your body, but you're also destroying the bad ba the good bacteria that exist within you as well. And this can often lead to antibiotic resistance. There are now strains that won't respond to any antibiotics. Acquiring an infection like that would shoot you back to the years prior to 1944, when the only means of treatment were amputation or arsenic. And most people died of infection in those days. We definitely need more comprehensive health policy that will allow us to maintain the integrity of these antibiotics. Though we may not realize it now, in the long run, we'll wish that we had done more to protect their value. Moving on to antimicrobial pesticides. These days, antimicrobial pesticides can be found in everything from shower curtains to fabric softeners. And the promotion of these products has created a world of germaphobes. We all know the efficacy claim, stating that a product will kill 99.9% .9 of germs. And we do what we can to prevent these microorganisms from potentially inconveniencing our lives. So we douse our homes in these products, we rub them on our hands. But without question, we purchase these products with the guarantee they work, with no regard to efficacy failure or exposure hazard. And the truth is, we don't really have a fixed amount of bacteria between our hands or our homes. So you can't really make an efficacy claim in a laboratory and expect it to hold the same weight out in the real world. In my introductory biology classes, we would have the students do before and after swabs using antimicrobial pesticides or hand sanitizers. And as you can see on side B, there was a reduction of the amount of bacteria present on the hands, but certainly not 99.9%. .9%. And really, you could be destroying the beneficial bacteria that could actually fend off harmful pathogens that are unaffected by these alcohol-based hand sanitizers. So why do we continue to rely so heavily on these products? <laughs> it's actually quite amazing how much we overuse these products. So what I'm trying to get at is that you don't really need to rely as heavily on these products as you think you do. I can understand people in healthcare settings that may be undergoing chemotherapy treatments, are suffering from HIV, or perhaps recently had a surgery or a leg amputation or an arm amputation. These people are extremely susceptible to these types of infections. So having these kinds of products at their disposal actually makes sense. But people like us with normally functioning immune systems don't need to depend on these products like we think we do. And I'd like to point out that I'm not suggesting any of you abandon your traditional hygiene practices, as they do work. We just shouldn't be tossing our homes and our hands in these types of products. The issue I have with antimicrobial pesticides is the inconsistencies among the literature. This top paper concluded that alcohol-based hand sanitizers should be used preferentially over soap and water while the bottom paper concluded the exact opposite, soap, not alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Shockingly, this third paper right here concluded that the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers actually leads to the increased skin absorption of BPA, or bisphenol A, which is a suspected carcinogen. The participants in the study had increased serum levels of BPA in their urine and serum, which is pretty scary. So what do we use if we don't know if it's good for you, if we don't know what's bad for you? How do we make a decision when you have all of these papers that are contradicting one another? And again, this showcases the importance of having more comprehensive health policy that focuses on the limitations of the distribution of these products to the community and also educates the general public on why we use them and how to properly use them. Believe it or not, you are heavily influenced by the media they shape your views on microorganisms in ways you can't imagine. It's really quite interesting. We were all recently affected by that Listeria scare. I think everyone remembers that. It unfortunately claimed innocent lives and, less importantly, removed Bluebell products from our shelves. <laughs> yeah, that was the big deal in the media. That's what they focused on. Oh, no, no Bluebell. <laughs> Anyways. Food contaminations occur in school cafeterias. Food contaminations occur at popular restaurants. You have boil advisories and food recalls issued. All of these things will keep the consumer on their toes. And the E. coli that we're introduced to by the media is the E. coli that will lead to uh, uh, infection. 
but we're very rarely told about the E. coli that exists within our gut that actually produces essential vitamin K. In marketing with food products that contain bacteria, like your yogurts, they'll always use words like live, live culture, digestive health, probiotic, but they'll never use the word bacteria, as many people associate this word with becoming sick. And next time you're at the store, next time you purchase yogurt, look at the back of the label. It's clearly stated there, but it's nicely blended in with the ingredients list, so you wouldn't even notice, but there actually is bacteria in these products that you eat, and they're beneficial to you. Every now and then, Hollywood also comes out with these pretty scary films that depict a global pandemic, and believe it or not, it actually influences people to go out and purchase products they think will protect them. At the end of 2014, when that Ebola scare happened, hand sanitizer sales went through the roof in the United States. People were actually going out buying these products thinking that it would prevent an Ebola outbreak. And it's extremely insulting to people in Ebola-ravaged nations who aren't reliant or aren't solely dependent on these alcohol-based hand sanitizers to prevent these outbreaks from spreading. And they're certainly not complimenting each other on the pomegranate cherry fragrance infused with moisture beads. It's very insulting. It's very, very insulting. And it's sad that we capitalize on fear and misinformation in this country in order to make a dollar. And you all know what I'm talking about. The variety of fragrances, the moisture beads, infused with aloe vera, the cute, tiny, individualized bottles. We all are guilty of purchasing these products at some point. And the truth is, the demonization of the microbe has gone on for far too long in this country. Far too long. While many bacteria can lead to death, there is a larger majority of microorganisms that contribute heavily to the preservation of life. So I stand here in front of you all today in defense of these microorganisms that we seem to be so afraid of. And by the end of it, I hope you'll think a little bit differently about them. For starters, you're completely covered in bacteria, and they actually account for about three to five pounds of your weight. So the next time you hop on the scale, you can blame those three to five pounds on those invisible <laughs> microorganisms that you actually can't see. They outnumber every cell in your body, and some of the locations include the skin, the eyes, the GI tract, the list goes on. But guess what? They're actually there to benefit you, not harm you. The way that I see it, we shouldn't really be using all of these products just because someone's telling us that they're good for you. You should actually think a little bit before you buy into these types of marketing schemes, right? I mean, I think so. You have to question these kinds of things. Why are we using them? Why are we so dependent upon them? So really what I'd like you guys to do is think a little bit more before you buy into these types of marketing schemes. Read scholarly articles regarding microorganisms and then formulate an opinion based off of that. Weigh it against the evidence that's being presented against you. Don't give in to fear and misinformation and certainly don't allow it to influence your attitudes, your values, your beliefs, and certainly not your shopping trends. Thank you very much. Thank you.